Welcome to the Like Phil podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. Today we're going to be talking to Jonathan Kay, the editor of Quillette, or editor of the, Can- the Canadian Bureau of Quillette. Uh, Jonathan Kay has been on the podcast before. He's a friend of the podcast. And it's a very interesting discussion. He's talking about his recent move to Quillette. He, of course, was at the Walrus uh, before, and even before that, he was with the National Post. Sort of talking about what he thinks Quillette is and where he wants to take it, what he wants to do with it. And he also talks about his recent attendance at the Heterodox Academy uh, conference in New York City, which is very, very fascinating, uh, but I'm not going give, to give that away. Uh, before that, just some housekeeping issues. Uh, if you'd like to support the Like Phil podcast, we need your support. There's a couple of ways you can do that. The most obvious one is to get, become a Patreon supporter of the podcast. Uh, you can do that by going to www.patreon.com slash podcast. It costs uh, a lot of money to produce these things and make them. And if you think this kind of long form, uh, unscripted, civil, re- reasonable conversations uh, are useful. If you think this kind of discourse is useful and you want to support it, then please do so. Uh, also, just to keep in up to date with what's happening with the podcast, there's two ways to do that. Uh, the first one is to become a member of our Facebook group. It's just called Likeville. So if you type that into the search bar, you should find it. Uh, also, you can start following us on Twitter. Our handle is at the Likeville pod. And we will keep you know, updates there about upcoming guests. You can sort of tell us questions you'd like us to ask them, um, all sorts of other stuff. Also, you can support us by liking us on iTunes, by sharing our podcast with your friends, uh, with your enemies. <laughs> if, you're, if you have a podcast of your own, you can discuss uh, things that we're discussing on ours. If you have a blog, you can mention the podcast on your blog. Uh, if you have a problem, I mean, we mainly uh, put our stuff through iTunes, but if you are not a big fan of Apple, you can listen to the podcast on overcast.fm. And as, as I've mentioned before, we are trying to get on Spotify. Uh, we're awaiting approval. As soon as that happens, we will let you know. And of course, we will let you know uh, through Facebook and Twitter. Right. So this podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, as well as Elsa's Bar in Montreal and Plateau Montreal. It's an amazing bar. It's the best place in the city, in my opinion. It's a real neighborhood place. If you're visiting Montreal, definitely check out Elsa's. Elsa's is where the locals go, as opposed to where the tourists go. It's a fantastic place, really great atmosphere, great food. Uh, you'll love it. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by Good Mix, which is a delicious sort of granola seed paleo mix that you put inside your yogurt and you have it for breakfast. It's absolutely delicious, really, really healthy, very good for you, fills you up for hours and hours and hours. Uh, it has great effects on your digestion, all sorts of things. Uh, really, really great stuff. And there's some links to Good Mix. This podcast is also brought to you by Seb Furtado Photography. Uh, Sebastian Furtado is a professional fine art photographer who is offering private online one-on-one classes for those who want to drastically improve their skills in photography. Uh, It's available to participants worldwide. Uh, Sebastian Furtado is an experienced teacher and workshop organizer. Uh, He'll teach you how your camera works, the camera basics, lighting, lenses, and how to shoot images and perfect them in Lightroom and Photoshop. If you're interested in this, go to www.sebfurtado.com slash store for more information. All right, without further ado, I give you Jonathan Kay. Welcome to the Like Phil podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. Today we're going to be talking with Jonathan Kay about his new gig, 
as an editor at Quillette. So I, I, all right. Hello, John. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. So you are the, what is your title? You, you're the, you're the editor of all the Canadian content or because it seems to me like you are having a hand in the, the project as a whole, not just the Canadian stuff. So I'm the Canadian editor, but it's a fairly small operation. So when when articles come in that I think uh, I can be useful as an editor, um, I'll, I'll jump in on those. And likewise, there are Canadian authors who aren't always suitable for me to edit. Uh, Quillette publishes uh, a lot of specialists, um, yeah. uh, scientists and so forth. Um, my boss uh, has a strong interest and expertise in, in psychology. So if someone comes in with, say, a Jungian analysis of such and such, which is way over my head, even if it's a Canadian author, uh, someone else will usually take that project. Okay, so that's that's sort of very similar to what happens with an academic journal where you the editors of the journal don't necessarily or even usually um, have mastery over all of these subfields that they're talking about, but they'll send it out to people who do, right? So. Yeah, and that's that's a particular issue with Quillette because we do exist at sort of the intersection of journalism and science in, in many cases. And so you really do need, I, mean, I happen to have a background in engineering and uh, statistics and that sort of thing. But there are things I, you know, I feel that there are editors who are, who are better than me to handle. Um, a lot of it also comes down to outreach. Uh, because I'm from Canada, I've worked in journalism in Canada for, for close to 20 years. I'm best suited to, to reach out to Canadian writers who I know uh, might be good on a particular subject. I can use my social networks. Um, and even just, you know, I worked at the National Post, I worked at Walrus, and there's just a whole bunch of writers who, who I know about who I've, well, I've actually started to recruit them to write for Walrus, uh, excuse me, <laughs> yeah. to, write for, write, I, to write for Quillette. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. That's like calling out somebody else's name in bed. That was awesome. But uh, the, the, uh, David Brooks has mentioned in a number of his op-eds and in his books that one of the things that made American democracy really strong is uh, what he calls sort of middle brow publications. And he says the, the high watermark for nonfiction in the United States was the 1950s. And it was largely because you had these uh, these really serious kind of middle brow publications that bridge the gap between uh, expert culture and the layperson. And that, um, would you say it's fair to say that Quillette is trying to be middle brow? I mean, I know that has such a bad connotation these days, but yeah, I, I mean, middle brow. I think probably the word might have meant something differently uh, a couple of decades ago than it does now. I do agree that the kind of publication that Brooks is talking about is extremely valuable. And I think at its best, uh, that, that, that is the kind of publication that, that Walrus is, that is the kind of publication that Atlantic Magazine is. Um, and I think that's the kind of publication that, that Quillette is. Um, I'm not sure I would use the term middle brow. What, what I, I tend to say is that these publications often will exist at the intersection or the nexus or whatever word you want uh, between uh, scholarly writing and, and lay writing. So they're a notch above or maybe a notch more comprehensive than uh, your, your daily newspaper, but it's also not a peer-reviewed journal. But it's a place where people who have the kind of expertise that draw them to state-of-the-art research that don't, that's published in, in peer-reviewed journals, this is the kind of place where people will come to, to discuss things like that, and sometimes actually will use the same kind of language. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you, you will see language in a Quillette article that you know, it's just not the kind of language you would see in a newspaper article um, because we demand more of our readers. Um, yeah. yeah. Like in a newspaper article, if you use certain kinds of words, uh, certain kinds of terminology about, for instance, about statistics or about epidemiology, it's, it's just going to turn people off. They're not going to read it. They're saying this is, this is wonky. Whereas... Quillette, we have the luxury of knowing that if people are on the Quillette website, chances are they are going to stick through an article that is written by a specialist uh, or about a specialty and goes on for maybe a few thousand words in a way that a regular newspaper or magazine article won't. Yeah, this is exactly what I mean. This is exactly what David Brooks has in mind when he talks about middle brow. Middle brow. But he, these are he he says these are publications where it was completely normal to assume that 
that the reader might have to put the article down for a second and open up their dictionary to look up a word that that was uh, you were you're sort of requiring something of the reader that you're you're presuming that your reader is an intelligent person uh, but you're not presuming that they you know they may have to bone up on you know some little details and words in order to follow the argument right and that's okay right and i, I would agree with that but i wouldn't even put the emphasis uh on on necessarily language because it's possible to use extremely obscure terminology and and say something stupid just as <laughs> just, just just as it's yeah. possible just as it's possible to use bare bones language and say something that's that's insightful yeah um, i think the form of challenge that the best kind of of uh, journalism in this field does it's not always on the level of of words and sentences often it's on the level of concepts where you're asking people to um, to challenge uh, propositions that they've they've long held, or it doesn't even have to be ideological. It could just be offering a new way of looking at things. You know, one of the proudest moments I had at Walrus was when um, we published this cover story by a woman named Mary Rogan, and it was one of the first stories that really tackled the issue of how young is too young for kids to transition when they identify as being transgender. Mm-hmm. And 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 it was it was an issue that at least in Canada I think had largely been addressed at the at the level of slogans, yeah. um, and 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 Mary, uh, just, who's a wonderful writer who I've known for many years, I mean she just wrote kind of the definitive piece, and I'm not sure you could point to any sentence or paragraph or even page of that article where you'd say oh this is too challenging for a casual reader. It's the article as a whole that that challenges the reader. I mean, I think it rewards the reader because it's, it's it's such a great piece and so comprehensive. But it's asking readers to 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 think of really important and fairly complex questions about how we make decisions in our society. Uh, and that, to me, would be like a big example of the kind of of journalism that, at its best, the Walrus or Atlantic or Quillette. Uh, or something like, you know, National Journal, uh, maybe a lesser known example uh, that they publish. Okay, well, for our listeners who aren't familiar with Quillette, can you just sort of briefly say what exactly is Quillette and where, you know, what do you want to do with it? You know, how did you find it and what do you want to do with it? Where do you see it going? Well, Quillette is the brainchild of a woman named Claire Lehman. Uh, She's Australian, uh, like me, former academic. And she created it three years ago, basically in her basement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I actually think uh, you know that's not a put down. I think that's how she describes it. And she created it for the same reason that I was attracted to Quillette, because there was nothing else like it. Because the landscape of high concept journalism generally is 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 tribalized between you know right and left and you have conservative publications and you have left-wing publications but that sort of rough tribal differentiation left a whole bunch of people completely alienated um, and, and that's people like me who I don't you know I'm not really conservative not I'm not really a liberal but I find like a lot of the ideas and questions I ask get me into trouble with one cra- one camp or the other. And I didn't see any place I could go to for high concept journalism, with some exceptions, that really allowed writers to keep the momentum of their ideas going without there being taboo topics and and areas of inquiry that you couldn't write about because that would upset certain editors or upset certain readers. It Quillette is as close as possible to being an intellectual uh, venue where as much as possible shibboleths and taboos are cast aside and smart people are are allowed to take their ideas to their logical conclusion, uh, especially when it comes to free scientific inquiry um, and, and just generally, the as I said, the intersection of science and the world of ideas. Yeah. You said something to me when we had you on the podcast last time, which is very interesting, and I did. So I I cited you on this a couple of times, but you said that one of the biggest problems that any publication, any newspaper, any magazine always faces is that there's a temptation to sort of get into a rut where you 
you sort of you get you're funded in certain ways you have certain constituencies and it's not you know direct it doesn't have to be like pravda but uh, the temptation for any publication is to end up being in a situation where you say the same three or four things in different ways all the time we talked about how this was actually a uh, one of the reasons why npr is so much more interesting than cbc radio most of the time because uh, with with too many of CBC radio programs, you know what they're going to say. It's like every, every it's going to be one of three or four different messages. And well, you know, you I talk- would say it's not just the messages. It's you know it's going to be one of three or four different guests, uh, depending on the topic. <laughs> it's well, it's just it's it's sad. I mean, Toronto is a you know we we love to talk about what a world class city Toronto is, but uh, in the intellectual community, in the journalistic community, uh, on certain topics. Uh, there's just, it's like, uh oh, here we go. You know, we, Mac Galloway is talking about, okay, you know, it's, and it's not even necessarily Mac Galloway is the morning host here in CBC in Toronto. And it's not necessarily that Mac Galloway himself might be constricted in who he wants to bring on. It's just, you know, he's surrounded by a bunch of 26 year old producers and they all are on Twitter, you know, retweeting the same four people. And those are the people who come on the show to talk about a particular issue. And it's, it's boring and tedious. And that's why we don't listen to it. And, Instead, I listen to my NPR one. Uh, it's NPR one is the name of the app I use um, because it's because the internet allows us to to listen to anything. Um, but it's but it's not. There are many ways of getting stuck in a rut, and one way is is through partisan politics. Um, like a, a common pattern is that a new journal or a new website will get set up, and it will start with high ambitions in terms of the breadth of ideas they present. But partisan politics has a way of slotting people into tribalized uh, compartments. And so a lot of, for instance, conservative media have now been trapped into being apologists for Donald Trump. Because mm-hmm. that, and, and that's and one thing you will not find on Quillette, and I don't think it's a coincidence that you will not find it. You won't find a lot of stuff about party politics. You won't find a lot of stuff about, uh, you know, why you should vote for, for this party and not that party, or, you know, why the party A is good and party B is bad. And uh, there's, there's more than enough of that in the other media. And, and one of the reasons we don't do that is because once you go down that road, once your contributors begin to think, okay, this is an outlet where it supports this party, but not that party, or it makes apologies for this politician, but not that politician, you've gone down the road to getting to that rut you've just described. Um, yeah. So, and, and that's, and I, I had no interest in going to a publication that, um, that was a mouthpiece for any particular partisan political entity in, in Canada or anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, practically just in terms of, how do you actually maintain that? Like, how do you prevent Quillette from becoming the kind of news organization that sort of puts out, you know, anybody who's saying one of these sort of five things, we're going to publish that because that reinforces, you know, a pre-existing sort yeah. of thesis that we have. There's, there's a few ways you can do it. One way is simply you, you publish people who disagree with you and, um, you know, on, on social the social media, sometimes I argue. I argue sometimes with Quillette's uh, most intransigent critics, uh, who sometimes I feel are arguing in bad faith. But if someone comes forward in good faith and says, uh, you know, this Quillette article you publish, it suffers from this or that fallacy, often the first thing I'll do is I'll say, great, you know, write a response. Um, we're we're open to that. That was certainly my attitude to the National Post. At the National Post, uh, I often would. Uh, when I was comment editor at that newspaper, I often would uh, would publish people who disagreed because it was it was fun, it was good journalism, and often it it did sometimes change people's minds. Uh, and so that's one way you can do it. Uh, but the other way is just the kind of people you bring into the organization. Uh, Quillette, there's there's only a handful of people who work full full time with Quillette. But what it, what I love about the people I work with, and I like to think this is true about me, we're not dogmatists. We, uh, we're not sloganeers. If you look at our Twitter feed, we don't use hashtags. You know, in, in the modern age, one of the surest signs that you're dealing with an unthinking dogmatist is that their social media feed is composed mostly of strings of hashtags. This is... <laughs> no, but I'm this, definitely quoting you on that. <laughs> but this, this is the equivalent of, of 
putting lawn signs out in front of your house uh, <laughs> or putting little flags. Vote on... Bernie. Vote Bernie. Yeah. No, it's 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 yeah. the vote Quinby approach to uh, to social media. And a lot of these hashtags I, I agree with. But if you were going to make hashtags the way you communicate with the world, uh, you know, hashtags are s- statements of um, uh, purpose or of belief or of ideology that by their nature are inflexible because that's, that's the nature of that medium. And when you see people communicate in this way, it blurs the line between journalism and advocacy. And yeah. Quillette is not about advocacy. And this was my, this was my doctrinal complaint at my last job at the walrus is, um, you know, I was surrounded by people who, who espoused causes. Many of these causes I, I agreed with, uh, but I always tried to remind them uh, of the line between being an activist and being a journalist. And even if it's being an activist in a good cause, uh, reconciliation with indigenous people, uh, anti-racism, uh, anti-sexism, uh, if you relentlessly make that the purpose of your role in life as an editor or a writer, um, you should declare yourself an activist and, and find another occupation because for one thing, the journalism you produce is going to be boring because people are going <laughs> to see your byline or see your involvement in an article and say, okay, you know, this is uh, a journalistic artifact that was created to advance a certain kind of activist agenda. And as I say, it may be an agenda I agree with. Um, I'm broadly liberal in my politics and my ideology. I just don't use journalism as a way to advance those things uh, in, in, in a sort of monolithic way because that it just becomes boring for the reader. And I think the statistics, the, the page view statistics you see from media companies uh, reflects this. Yeah, there's, it's funny, the, the great German sociologist, Max Weber, he made exactly this sort of argument. It was in Science as a Vocation. And he argued that you basically have to choose between the life of an academic or the life of basically of an intellectual, which he says is very much a secularized version of the monastic life. You, you are devoted to truth. You follow it wherever it goes. You have to, or you can become a, go into political life and become an activist or a politician. And that is, and he says they're basically doing two different, uh, they're both important, but they operate according to different rules. And if you try and do both, you're basically going to do neither well, right? So if you're, because your commitment to truth is going to get in the way of your activism or your activism is going to get in the way of your pursuit of truth. Right. So I, I guess so you're saying, yeah. So you're saying that is very much, yeah. Uh, I think it's true. Uh, and by coincidence, uh, that point um, is very much at the heart of the piece that I just wrote for Quillette. I, I think it was posted yesterday on the website. And it's about uh, Justin Trudeau and uh, the controversy surrounding these uh, this 18-year-old groping allegation. And I don't know anything about the truth of that allegation. But toward the end of my article, I said, Uh, The big problem with Trudeau is that from the beginning, he has essentially presented himself as an activist for uh, for feminism and for Me Too movement and um, the movement against sexual assault, all of which I completely agree with. I think these are great causes. The problem is it's not the role of a prime minister to be an activist, because at the end of the day, you're going to be called on to reconcile um, the fight for... Uh, the fight for equal rights and the fight against sexual abuse um, and the fight for me too, you're going to have to reconcile that with things like due process. Um, And as a politician, that's your role to reconcile these things, to pass laws that are fair to everybody. And sometimes that means making compromises between different kinds of important principles. But when you're an activist, you can't do that because the role of an activist is to set out the maximalist position for a certain activist proposition whether you're an environmentalist or whether you're, you know, identity politics or civil liberties, you set up the maximalist position on behalf of your cause, and then you let politicians and judges and legislators uh, hash out the best way to to make compromises between your cause and other causes. But if you're elected as prime minister and you declare yourself an activist, it's completely irreconcilable uh, because no, Every principle in our society has to somehow coexist with other principles. 
you know, the fight against sex abuse has to coexist with the fight against due process. And if you declare yourself an activist for one, then people who, who are concerned about the other uh, principle are understandably going to say this is this is not a, this is not a government that reflects me, and this is unfair. And when the when the politician himself is caught up in allegations, uh, as Trudeau now is, all of the hypocrisy of uh, his activist mantras come home to roost. Because yeah. when it came to to other people, including people in, in Justin Trudeau's own caucus, who were accused but not proven to have have done anything wrong. Uh, you know, gone afoul of the Me Too movement, uh, Trudeau responded the way an activist would. But now that the shoe's on the other foot, he looks like a hypocrite. And so I think this is this is something politicians have to be wary of. But I also think, getting back to our conversation, this is something journalists have to be wary of uh, because uh, you'll, some, for a very crass reason that if you become an activist journalist, you're going to sing from the same songbook every time. People are going to get bored and your career is going to suffer, and you're going to become a parody of yourself because every single column is going to reflect the same mantras. Yeah, I guess my question to you, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be annoying about this, but like, I just don't know how you can ever entirely escape that because you're always getting your bills paid by somebody at some point, right? Now, now I, I would not want to relativize. Clearly, there's, there's differences, uh, huge differences, but if you are, you have a major sort of, I don't know, somebody who's like paying for a lot of your, they buy a lot of advertising and things like that. If you say something against their product or against their particular stance, well, they, they might sort of withdraw their funding and that could, that could hurt you. And I remember Claire did a fantastic interview with Jordan Peterson. And one of the questions they talked about was, you know, why have you decided not to have ads? And why have you decided on Quillette? And she said, well, because running us on basically just patreon it allows us to have much more control we don't have to we can kind of do what we want we can have long form we can publish articles and not be obsessed with page views and things like that which i thought was fantastic and it's a very solid argument uh the only thing as we saw with the walrus you know is that let's say it it, you know, I'll say a hypothetical example. Let's say it turns out that 80% of your Patreon supporters are really big fans of, I don't know, Miley Cyrus <laughs> right. or Jordan Peterson or, you know, whatever, fill in the blanks. And you publish an article and that is critical of Miley Cyrus, right? And now you notice the next day that 20% of your Patreon supporters are gone. And they've told you on the way out, you know, before slamming the door, I'm breaking up with you. When they say specifically, I'm, I'm doing this because you said mean things about Miley Cyrus. What, you know, are, you know, what happens there? Like, are you going to think twice before publishing another article that's critical of Miley Cyrus? Well, first of all, I, I'd like to condemn that horrible stereotype you just gave of a Miley, Miley Cyrus's fan's voice. Because, uh, <laughs> That's I. I'm sure there are Miley Cyrus fans who speak in, uh, in, a, in a real baritone. Um, I so I think this is a worry on both ends. So it's a worry when you've published the anti Miley Cyrus article and people are fleeing your site because they're outraged. But the best way to deal with that problem is 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 on the front end, and that is to make sure when you're creating content and you're sitting around with other editors. Uh, in my case, you know, virtually, because we exist on different continents and we're on Skype or whatever, that we say to ourselves, uh, you know, let's make sure we are not turning our site into uh, a sort of a cult for any one person or ideology, because that's what Quillette is a refuge from places that are, are ruled by dogma or, um, you know, have no go zones intellectually. And uh, you, you touched on Jordan Peterson. And I think this is very important because there are people who speak of Jordan Peterson as a sort of prophet yeah. and, and whose dedication to Jordan Peterson goes beyond intellectual and they will watch his videos and, and they will actually, you know, I, I know one woman who in Toronto, who I respect very much. And she told me that she went through a period of depression and for two weeks, she just watched Jordan Peterson videos. And at the end of it, she said, this is ridiculous. It's like I'm becoming a Scientologist. 
Uh, <laughs> but and and I should say, Peterson himself does not encourage this kind of cultish behavior. No, but, he really doesn't. But yeah. he's 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 a very effective speaker, and people do respond in this way. And and I've had conversations with my my colleagues at Quillette, and we say, look, if you know we. Uh, we do run articles that, that sometimes praise Jordan Peterson or at least analyze his ideas in a respectful way. Uh, when we get ideas that, when we get articles that criticize Jordan Peterson in a way that we find interesting, we should run those too. Uh, and we have. And so on the front end, there may be people who say, oh, I'm not going to give money to Patreon, uh, you know, to the Patreon account of, of Quillette because uh, they ran this article that was critical of Peterson. That's fine because you know, you don't have the money you don't have. The problem comes when you go down the road of um, of venerating, consistently venerating a particular idea or a particular person or a particular institution, and then you're beholden to them because yeah. then you you get used to the income stream, and then six months later you do run the article that's critical of of this person or idea or institution, and then there's a backlash, and then you know, and then there's no good answer. You either lose all the money or you end up, I don't know, not that Quillette would ever do this, you take down the article or you apologize. And once you've done that, that's, you know, forget it. You've, that's, you're just like everybody else when you do that. Yeah, you've just, you know, that's a very interesting way of putting it, thinking about it in terms of the front end. And that, that actual, what I like about your, your way of thinking about it is that that puts a lot more of the sort of moral responsibility on the editors at the front end to make sure that you're not uh, signaling the wrong things like if you're basically sort of giving people a lot of reasonable grounds for assuming that you're on their side 100 percent, then and then you suddenly do something that sort of upsets them well they can you know justifiably say well i thought we had an agreement here i thought you were pro x or anti you know why right. right? you need to avoid that and and you need to avoid that and I think Quillette does avoid it, but it, it only avoids it because you have editors who, who think about that in a very self-aware way every day. And that includes me, that includes, that includes uh, Claire. Uh, we have a, an editor in, in London, uh, a guy named Jamie, who's absolutely scrupulous about this sort of thing. And um, th- this is, you, if you ignore this principle, if you're not self-aware, about what we just talked about, yeah, you will lapse into a sort of lazy pattern where you say, well, this this subject always gets hits, this viewpoint always gets hits, this author always gets hits, and you sort of back end into dogma. I mean, not every dogmatist is sort of like the stereotype of, you know, somebody who's in a library with a beret, you know, re- reading <laughs> tomes and saying... I have decided that I am now a follower of, you know, Freud or Marx or whatnot. And it's sometimes you just back into it, into it by habit or because everybody in your peer group agrees with a certain sort of thing, or because you found that there are career advantages to publishing a certain kind of article. Um, you know, one of my complaints about uh, you know, the CBC and the Toronto star and, and whatnot is uh, on certain issues, they're just always publishing the same kind of article and they're terrified about running any kind of counterpoint to it. And I don't necessarily think this is because the people who are on top of these organizations uh, have a monolithic point of view. They have just found that on on these issues, um, they get lots of compliments and are told that they're very enlightened by their much younger staff or people on Twitter who have an outsized voice because of the nature of social media when they make certain editorial decisions and they get themselves into trouble with those constituencies when they make any other kind of editorial decision. And yeah. so just through this quirk of the marketplace of ideas, as it now manifests itself, they end up creating a fairly dogmatic, monolithic, ideological uh, offering for their, for their readers or viewers. Um, not because they're dogmatists or ideologues, but just because that's, you know, that's the side of the bread that's buttered. And that's kind of, they find that's the easiest way to get through uh, the workday with the least amount of controversy. Yeah. And this seems to me, you know, from the people that I know and a lot of people very close to me and family members even have gone through journalism programs. And it strikes me that this is a subtle, a subtlety that they just are not taught because they come out and they have this very, very idealistic view that I, you know, I should basically go and it should be completely free and I should be able to write 
about whatever I want, you know, however I want. And this should, everything should be, which of course it's a business, you know, there's somebody's, somebody's paying the bills. And so that's not going to be true. But then they imagine the opposite is that, uh, you know, just straight up like PR, right? Like, and of course there's these subtleties where people who are very well intentioned can fall into these patterns without even realizing it. But one example I wanted to actually bring up with you is you, of course, you know, your hometown here in Montreal has been ripped apart by this whole Slav as uh, slave, you know, controversy. This, And what you see there is the, for the most part, the French press has sort of lined up uh, behind supporting the production and the English press has lined up uh, behind supporting the activists. And a lot of what they're saying doesn't even so much have to do with the production. It has to do with existing battle lines, right? Yeah. Here's an example to prove that, you know, French people are racist and we're more enlightened. And, oh, here's an example to, you know, prove that, uh, you know, the English North America has lost its mind with political correctness and all this other stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, and um, I'd like to tell you a story on that subject, if that's okay. If I yeah, yeah, shoot, because you you were the only interesting voice that I heard on this, and it was that one clip that I found for you. You know that I found oh, the CBC, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that was the only person I heard that was saying something other than what everybody else was saying. Either one of the two monoliths. So sure, and just in, in case there are people listening who, who, you know, this might have escaped their attention. This oh, is right, right. We're, yeah. we're talking about uh, a presentation, part of the jazz festival uh, in Montreal, and this was uh, an artistic production. Uh, you know, famous, uh, famous artist Robert Lepage, and the theme was black slavery, uh, but but most of the performers were white, and so they canceled the remaining uh, productions of the show. Uh, which was called Slav because black community members, some members of the black community complained that it was insulting and an act of cultural appropriation to have uh, a largely white ensemble sing these songs as part of a performance that was themed to black slavery. And, you know, we've talked about cultural appropriation before. The, the other time I was on the podcast, what was interesting about this is uh, when this all blew up, uh, uh, we had as a house guest, Someone, a lawyer, uh, a friend from Quebec who doesn't really follow politics that much. And uh, she was having dinner with us and someone said to her, oh, you know, have you heard about this controversy that they had to cancel this production because the people were the wrong skin color? And, and this woman, this is Franca from, from Quebec, who was our house guest, she started laughing. She said, oh, you stupid politically correct Toronto Anglos. And we said, and, 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 and she hadn't kept up with the news. And we said, you know, no, no, Chantal, um, <laughs> this is in Montreal. And her face went white. And she said, what the fuck? <laughs> and, and we're like, no, no, this is, you know, this is, a, you know, basically French production in Montreal. And, and they were forced to close it down. And, and she was horrified. And she said, um, which I find credible. She said, what I hate about this is basically you have the uh, guilty cultural re uh, reflexes of, of Canadian Anglo Protestants, which have now migrated to, um, to the French cultural space in Quebec, because we have, you know, we're all on the same Facebook pages and the same uh, Twitter streams. And so, you know, the, the, the French powers that be, um, in Montreal have now had to uh, toe the line on what until now until now was essentially uh, an Anglo cultural phenomenon, this, this morbid fear of cultural appropriation. And I felt terrible for her because uh, Quebecois society has until now been the um, they've been the only part of Canadian society that have, has really pushed back against a lot of this political correctness. Uh, in part because they themselves uh, feel culturally besieged by Anglo society. So they have much less time than Anglo society, which feels itself as part of the monolith of North American Anglo culture. Uh, you know, they, since they themselves feel besieged and victimized, they're, they're much more resistant to claims that they themselves are victimizing others. Uh, but now they themselves, but now they've been taken up in the same uh guilt reflex that, that Anglo culture uh, has, has been uh, suffused with for the last few years. 
I wonder if they have though. My my impression is that actually this has led a lot of people to double down. I think it's it's going to have uh, some sort of an effect on the next election. I think it's moving a lot of the at, at the very least it's moving a lot of the francophone chattering classes and the cultural elites and the kind of people who read Le Devoir. It's reading it, it's pushing those people to some extent to the right politically. It's making them a little bit more conservative, a little less uh, open to multiculturalism than they were before. I, I think actually, it, I don't think it's so much brought them into the orbit as made them feel more alienated from it. I right? think um, I think there are a lot of people of good faith in Quebec. I grew up uh, in Quebec, and um, although my French is bad, I um, I'm very proud of my my Quebec roots, and I think. Um, in Quebec, as everywhere else, the idea is that multiculturalism is at its best when it expands our cultural options. And it expands the viewpoints to which we're exposed. It ex expands the, the, the books and the movies and, and the food, everything that we're exposed to. When multiculturalism becomes a strategy for censorship and shutting people down and putting people in boxes and telling people to stay in their lane, that's the worst part of multiculturalism. And I think Quebecers, um, to the extent they're reacting negatively to uh, this controversy, I agree with them. Uh, I tell the story, I'm not sure if I've told you the story, but um, uh, shortly before I left my last job, I was at this magazine awards ceremony uh, in Toronto. It was, it was <laughs> um, the Canadian journalistic industry is shrinking but we seem to be expanding the number of, of glitzy awards ceremonies where we give each other's <laughs> trophies. Like it's, it's, it's our favorite activity. We just, yeah. uh, rent. Everybody out. gets a gold medal. Yeah. Yeah. We rent out yeah. Toronto hotel ballrooms and, um, tell each other how important and wonderful we are. Yeah. And I was at one Toronto, of these where, Toronto, where all the women are strong, the men are good looking and all the journalists are above average. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, I think that's the mantra should be careful or that's going to be printed on a cocktail napkin <laughs> in next year's event. Anyway, so uh, I think it was 2016, uh, I think it was spring, and I was, I was at one of these events. And um, it was 2016, 2017, sorry, I think it was early 2017. And it was Canada 150, and Anglo-Protestant Canada was deep into the throes of its guilt agony over, um, uh, in regard to the Indigenous pushback on Canada 150. And uh, there was this magazine uh, award event, and the, <laughs> the organizers were so terrified of, of pissing anybody off that they actually had not one, not two, but three things at the beginning of the show uh, to, to, uh, to honor Indigenous people. They had uh, a woman, I, I'm not sure if she burnt something or it was holy water or something like that. It was like a religious ceremony. And then there was a woman, an indigenous woman, who gave a speech about um, an indigenous perspective on the magazine industry. And then there was another sort of thing that involved a song or something like that. And as an Anglo from Toronto, I was there in the audience, sort of with my solemn expression on my face, even though, to be honest, I found it unnecessary and somewhat condescending towards indigenous people. Um, I just sat there stony facing, like, when is this going to be over? And I was sitting very close to the ta a table of French journalists. Um, I forget which publication they were from. And they were just all openly rolling their eyes. Like they were saying, like, <laughs> when is this crap going to be over? Like they, they couldn't believe it. You know, they came all the way from Montreal and here they are wasting their time with, um, you know, some kind of religious ceremony. Um, I mean, if a Catholic priest had been up there reciting similar incantations, everyone would be horrified by it. And um, uh, I think people in Quebec are more likely to call out the hypocrisy of this kind of spectacle. And in Toronto, I think we're expected to just bow our head and put on our solemn face. And I've always admired the fact that when uh, Quebecois come to Toronto and see this kind of thing, uh, they're horrified by it and they're right to be horrified by it. Well, the and quiet revolution is is not far away, right? So there's still this idea that we really want to have a separation between church and state. We want to have a, a secular public space and people can have religious private spaces. And, you know, but in the public square, it's supposed to be officially secular, right? It is. And, um, and I've written about this uh, for Quillette um, that... Uh, you know, we now live in a society where 
people have almost no kind of public ritual. Uh, you know, no one sings. We're not in America. We don't, you know, um, we don't sing God bless America. We don't say God save the queen. No one goes to church anymore. Um, very few of us know our neighbors. Uh, everyone's in their car uh, or they're looking at their phone. There is very little engagement with the world around us. And these land acknowledgements that are now part of events in Toronto and to a lesser extent, the rest of Canada, um, these have more or less replaced public prayer as the only real form of ritualized civic engagement that people have in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, I just true story. Just last week, uh, you know, a very good friend of mine is running for uh, writing for public office was in right here in Montreal on a particular riding. And she's been going around the city and having these these amazing kind of meetings and houses and in small groups like all over the place and having uh, face to face long conversations with uh, with future constituents, you know, and and so I've, I've gone to a number of these things. They're very, very interesting. And, and I support her a great deal. But I noticed at the beginning of the last one that I went to, she took the time to say, I would like to acknowledge that we are settlers on like, you know, like she did exactly what you were talking about. And it, it was kind of, it was kind of amazing. I thought, well, this is exactly like when I've had, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm practicing Christian. And like when I've had, let's say a big uh, baptism party or Easter party at my house, you know, when one of my kids was just getting confirmed, then, you know, you invite a lot of people back to your house and you have a party and, you know, it'd be people from the church or not, right? All sorts of mix. But my pastor at the beginning of before we ate would say a couple of words and say a little prayer, right? For me, doing that in a secular environment strikes me as incredibly weird and really kind of inappropriate. And it, it, it makes me, it feels like a violation of some sort of profane and sacred barrier that we should be like i would never in the classroom for instance at john abbott college i would never in a million years uh you know talk about my religious affiliation and, and get up and say can we say say a short prayer before you start this exam i mean you know what i mean yeah it's but you have to look at at the at the emotional appetites that lie behind these things because uh, you know you you're religious uh but most people aren't, uh, at least I should say, that, you know, most what, what Stephen Harper would call, call uh, old stock Anglos. Um, you know, there's a, around the corner from where I used to grow up on Dufferin Road, there's there's an Anglican church that uh, now has become part of Solomon Schechter. Uh, so, you know, churches are now being turned into daycare centers. And condos. That's uh, the best. Yeah, there's actually there's, there's a, a Unitarian church. Um, uh, here in my neighborhood, that's now become the de facto synagogue here in Toronto. That's where people have their <laughs> bar mitzvah class. But my, my point here is that um, people have certain emotional appetites. Um, and one of their appetites is they need an explanation of human sin. They need an explanation of human evil. Uh, they need uh, practices and uh, and rituals that they think can serve to publicly absolve themselves of the stain of sin that is the residue, even for secularized people, of Christian thought. And uh, these land acknowledgments have become uh, a way for people to deal with these impulses that they don't know quite know what to do with because we live in a secularized society. And, um, and if you look at the, you know, and there's a grain of truth to it. There was more than a grain of truth to it. I mean, there's many, many horrible things were done to indigenous people. I don't think any reasonable people would, uh, any, any reasonable person would say that's not true. But the sanctimonious and often and deeply hypocritical way it's become part of the fabric of, of, of uh, civil society uh, is worrisome. And it is hypocritical. I point out that in Toronto, many of the people, uh, the wealthy Rosedale types who bow their heads lowest during these land acknowledgements in Toronto, you know, they then hop into their Land Rover and they drive up to Muskoka uh, and they go to their country houses, uh, many of which are very close to places that were, were thriving, settled areas uh, for Indigenous people before the Europeans came over and took their land. And if somebody said, hey, uh, you know, that's a lovely 10-acre lakefront estate you have. Uh, did you know that that used to be 
uh, land that was controlled by this or that group, uh, they, would, <laughs> they would be horrified to think that they had to give up a square inch of it, uh, no matter how many land acknowledgements they said when they were presiding over the Ladies Rosedale Book Club or wherever the hell they were singing uh, their uh, their land acknowledgements. I mean, it just it's uh, it's a very hypocritical situation, and yeah, and 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 it's a window into, as I say, the the emotional appetites that people are left with in a post-religious society. Yeah. Well, and I guess that you've just struck on exactly what gets on my nerves about it. I mean, you've I, I saw you got into a Twitter fight with. Uh, with that guy Matthew Sears, you know, on, on, and you know he he wrote this article, which you you may have read. Uh, it was at the beginning of, you know, right at the beginning of the year, and he said, you know, I'm going to start 2018 by recognizing my white privilege, right? And it's this whole uh, argument about how like my white male privilege trait and all this stuff. And what bugged me about the article was not was not so much that I, I necessarily disagreed with everything he was saying. It was just, you know, if you really believed all these things, then why don't you sort of give up your position and sort of say, I really would like this position to be given to somebody from, you know, in this demographic, this group. Like, I, I don't think I should be like, that would be um, what they call in the, you know, behavioral economics that that would be costly signaling that would be signaling that you actually it costs you something what bugs me is the signaling that doesn't cost the person anything right but it benefits them a great deal or a little bit well this is <laughs> this is one of my complaints when i was at the walrus which uh which when i got there uh and when i left and still now is um you know it's <laughs> it's a pretty white place uh, it's like much of the Canadian media, it's uh, guilty, white, well-educated, middle-class and upper-middle-class people uh, flagellating themselves in a highly performative way. And what Sears did, I, I think the article you're talking about, it's, um, it's a Globe and Mail article with the headline, I'll start 2018 by recognizing my white privilege. Yes, that's um, it. Yeah, and this is, um, it's strangely status seeking status affirming behavior in the same way that a popular preacher might uh, make a great show of, of talking about how he is just a sinner and I am the greatest sinner among you and uh, who among us doesn't have sins to confess. Um, like this is a sort of theatrical form of virtue signaling now. Yeah. And and it's becoming trite. And actually, what's what's interesting now is on Twitter, some of the most in, interesting people to follow on Twitter are people uh, people of color who who will will call out these whites and say, just just shut the hell up. Like I, I get it. Like just you know, you're white. You feel bad about it. Like we don't need to hear about it all the time. And um, you know, maybe the best path for all of us going forward is. Yes, we should stop being jerks and, and, you know, for if you see a genuine act of bigotry, you should call it out. Uh, there's no place for racism in our society. Certainly not when it comes to, you know, if you're a landlord using race as a way to assign, you know, give people apartments or jobs or whatnot. But um, I think even people of color are just getting tired of this relentless and strangely narcissistic strain of, of ideology that now exists, which... Um, which results in white people drawing attention to themselves and their own virtue by talking about how acutely they feel guilt for for white privilege or white supremacy or whatever buzzword they're using. Um, uh, and I don't have the moral authority to call them out because because you know I'm a cishet white man. But you do <laughs> see an increasingly large number of people of color, many of whom write for Quillette, by the way. Who who find it condescending and who are and, and 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 hypocritical and just plain boring. Like it's it's we've been doing this for several years now, and and eventually it just gets tedious. Yeah. Uh, and, and even people of color are beginning to say that. Well, I know that uh, you know I have a lot of family members that are very very deeply religious in the United States. That are sort of very evangelical, you know, sort of fundamentalist Christians, and they've told me. Lots of them have told me they find it really annoying when conservatives, political conservatives or Republicans or even Democrats do this as well, 
when they sort of pepper their speeches with Jesus and God and 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 they're basically you can tell that they don't have a live connection to this tradition it's not really a part of their life but they realize that they need to sort of uh, virtue signal i mean virtue signaling is not just a thing on the left at all right i mean uh, and so they they'll sort of mouth these words because that's sort of what's required and it ends up being condescending to people who really know uh, you know what they're talking about they why don't you just say nothing rather than you know saying this stuff right but but i mean i think there's a deeper sort of tactical problem or maybe even strategic problem with this and that's that i the more I think about it, I, I'm not sure if guilt is a terribly good motivator. You know what I mean? Like, like a long-term motivator for change. I don't know if it's the best motivator. Well, um, you know, I think a lot of us use the term guilt as a broad category. Um, when sometimes what we, what we really mean is, is, is empathy or sympathy or regret. I do think that societies work best when people can put themselves into the shoes of other people. And one of the worst things that's happened to our society without us even realizing it over the last couple of decades is the socioeconomic um, compartmentalization of society. And, and lots of people have written about this, um, but basically 50 years ago, it was very common for school teachers to live in the same neighborhood as CEOs and lawyers and police and secretaries and firemen and academic professors. Like there was just sort of, there were neighborhoods where there was, you know, or politicians, best of all, because they have to represent all these people. And, and there was just a lot of casual intermingling of the social classes. And that's all changed. Um, and par partially because of our obsession with real estate. Um, where you just have rich people living in rich person neighborhoods and rich people marrying rich people because yeah. you're, you're no longer meeting, you know, your wife or husband from a neighborhood friend when you're 21, you're meeting them at grad school when you're 31. And so there's socioeconomic self-organization within social classes. And as a result, people just don't have any kind of, of empathy or understanding for people in other groups in, in our society. And that's not, you know, the kind of understanding that comes from living cheek by jowl with other people is not an artifact of ideology. It's an artifact of lived human existence. And that's the best kind of sympathy and empathy that, that we can hope for because it becomes part of the way we view the world. If your guilt or your sympathy for other groups is coming from a land acknowledgement uh, or coming because, you know, you took a critical race theory course, then it becomes a, a very brittle and dogmatic uh, uh, piece of, of information that manifests itself in things like hashtags and things like land acknowledgements and, and things like dogma and things like call outs where because it's not part of your lived experience and you're insecure about it, you end up projecting that insecurity by just relentlessly calling out other people on social media when what you're really doing is signaling the fact that you yourself don't believe that you authentically embody these values because they haven't been part of your life experience. That's why I'm much more concerned about the lived reality of our society, which is that poor people and rich people don't live in the same neighborhoods anymore, or even middle class and rich people don't live in the same neighborhoods anymore. I'm much more concerned about that than the passing fashions that you see uh, in the academy or in activist community. Yeah, no, that's that's a really, really interesting point. That's also uh, Jonathan Haidt in his book, uh, the Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. He makes that point. He goes on at length and he says, you know, it used to be that uh, Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C., they lived there. Right. And so their kids would be on the same soccer team. Your, your daughters are in the same ballet practice. They go to the same schools. And so you'd have all these informal interactions where you'd bump into people at the restaurant and uh, where you could develop this sort of sense that sure we disagree politically and we're in different parties but you know i we have a lot of stuff in common and so it would make people more likely to compromise to to listen to the other side to but he said what all of that changed with the kind of contract with america and the sort of changes within the republican party which then were mirrored by the democratic party where they started 
uh, not, they would just fly in, right? They wouldn't actually live there. And so now they didn't have all of these, in exactly what you're talking about, these informal interactions. And that has polarized things a great deal because now they're no longer, you know, you're not running into the person at the soccer field anymore and having just a, a low key conversation that reminds you that this person's, you know, it's just a, a guy in khaki pants who's trying to, you know, work it out, right? Like but this, this, con- this compartmentalization, I, I, I agree with, and uh, Robert Putnam has written about it, and David Brooks has written about it, and it manifests itself electronically. And, um, and this is this is one of the reasons why Canadian media is in crisis, because you know if you read Canadian Huffington Post or Canadian Vice or uh, or Walrus or Toronto Star, Globe and Mail or CBC, the reason it all sounds like the same mush is because it's written and edited by people reading and retweeting the same 17 Twitter accounts. And there's this homogenizing effect that comes from electronic media. And I think journalists, it's their duty to escape it. That's one of the reasons I try and be diverse and and ideologically diverse in uh, what I read and what I expose myself to. But the geography is a huge problem. Uh, Every year I spend a week at uh, what I call Del Boca Vista, which is my my in-laws have a... uh, they live in a, well, they don't live, they, they vacation in a gated community in Florida. Oh, wow. And, yeah. I, well, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. It's like, it's like a Margaret Mead or something. I, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. let, let me tell your listeners about what these yeah. people eat and what they, but yeah. it's, it's, it's exactly, these aren't bad people, but they've, a lot of them have spent the last 10 or 20 years of your life, of their lives, literally living beyond, behind a gate and, on Fox News, they're told that on the other side of the gate are all these rampaging Hispanic gangs that just want to steal and rape everybody. And you have to elect an alpha male who's going to protect you from the people with brown or black skin. And these people who are living there, they may not be have been born bad people or become bad people, but the geography of isolation causes them to be fearful and xenophobic and tribalized. And, uh, you know, as, 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 as horrible as the effects of groupthink on social media and the left, uh, it's just as bad or worse in terms of, you know, Rush Limbaugh and Fox News and some of the really right-wing uh, websites and the effect it is, happen- it is having primarily on older white people in the United States. Um, part of it is geography, part of it is electronic, but you have people who are who are deeply tribalized, and it's it's pathological on both sides. Yeah. Well, there's uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, which totally fits into this. Is one of the themes in a lot of a lot of your writing, and I've definitely contributed to this as well, are the problems with campus politics and extremism and things like that. And but one of the things that I've become more and more aware of just in the last sort of couple of months is that in the same way that there's organizing that is trying to sort of undermine academic sort of university culture on the left. There's also a fair amount of organizing happening on the right, which I, for some reason, was just not aware of, right? There are actually the equivalent of kind of training camps and conferences where sort of uh, conservative activists, right-wing activists go and they are trained and they hear motivational speakers. It's like almost like Jesus camp. And they tell them precisely how to go back to their campus and how to sort of provoke uh, some sort of issue, how to cover it, you know, what to say to the what to say to the newspapers, what to say to the reporters and things like that. So I don't know what to, I mean, what, what do you make of that? What I make of it is, first of all, I think that's largely an American phenomenon. I think in Canada, uh, I've spent some time on campuses uh, giving speeches and talking to students uh, for my podcast and whatnot. And I, I think in Canada, this is in, at its, in its infancy, uh, if it exists at all. It's one of the reasons people are so fascinated by Lindsay Shepard at Laurier is just there's, there's just so few other people like her. Um, but in the United States, I think both sides... Are, are copying each other's bad habits. Uh, I heard a very interesting presentation from uh, a guy who works with a group called FIRE, uh, F-I-R-E. It, 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 basically, it's, it's a, a group that promotes uh, free speech on campus. 
And and one thing people don't realize is, you know, these trigger warnings we always talk about and we always yep. make fun yep. of? Um, on many campuses, the the people who complain most about trigger warnings are not left-wing students. They're religious students who complain because a sexual theme has been introduced into their course materials. And they complain that they find it very triggering. And so this, this thing that maybe originally, you know, it was for snowflakes who didn't want to, uh, you know, read about anti-Semitism in, in uh, Merchant of Venice or something like that. Uh, you know, people on the right have been more than happy to co-opt that whole idea of snowflake, uh, eggshell, trigger warnings, all that stuff. And um, so it's happening on both sides. I would also say what's worse now than when I was on campus is because everything on social media is permanent, students no longer have the right to be stupid. <laughs> you know, when I went, you know, there, there may be people listening to this who, who went to school with me uh, at McGill University in, in the early 90s. And I said, and sometimes wrote all sorts of stupid things. Yeah. And, uh, and I think a lot of people who are now middle-aged journalists also said and wrote stupid things because saying and writing stupid things and having people tell you they're stupid is one of the ways we learn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but those were the days when, you know, it wasn't captured for eternity on, uh, on the internet. And I have a huge amount of sympathy for students these days. And I understand maybe why they're very politically correct when they know that one wrong tweet can have an effect on their career prospects five or 10 years later. And if everything I wrote or said were preserved, everything from McGill University, uh, I mean, it would just, <laughs> I'd be unemployable. And I think the same would be true with everyone I went to school with. And because we just, we, we treated those years as a way to flesh out what our worldview was. And people on the left did that too. You, you know, if you read some of the articles that were in the McGill Daily, just ridiculous <laughs> testaments to Maoism. <laughs> You know, there was, I remember there was some guy who went to Albania and talked about how it was a worker's paradise and people spouted all kinds of crap because yeah. university is a, is, is a time in your life when you spout crap. You're looking for an ideology. So, you know, you read the fountainhead and you decide that Anne Rand is your goddess or, you, you know, you become a Scientologist for six months and bore everybody with that crap or, <laughs> um, uh, you know, or communism or, or, or you know, you decide uh, the World Trade Organization is the devil and, you, you know, you go get tear gassed at one of these conferences. It's this is that's what you're supposed to do in university. What I, what I don't like now is that all of those experiments you do end up being part of your permanent record. And as a result, students understandably have become very conservative in their habits. And it's and it, it, I understand why they toe the line on sensitive issues uh, and in a way that we would call politically correct. Yeah, I just, I wonder if we maybe need to spend more time talking about the threats to free speech that are coming from, from the right, you know, as well. Because it seems to me that I definitely underestimated how serious that was. I didn't realize that there were people that were Sort of, it's it's the classic problem that Karl Popper talks about. Like, if you have some a political party in a in a democracy, if you have a political party that says, "If we are elected, we will cancel elections," do you let them run? You know, now I, I, a free speech sort of absolutist would say, "Well, yes," you know, because we're a free society. Uh, but you know, there's other people who are very committed to free speech who would say, "Look, if you're if part of your platform is you're going to take away my free speech if you get power, then you don't, you know, you don't get free speech. Right? I think, uh, yeah, except I think there are very few examples of, of genuine communists or genuine fascists or genuine um, anarchists or, or hate mongers um, who who are trying to speak on, uh, speak on campus. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, when I was younger, you had people like Keekstra and Ernst Zundel. Um, I mean, people forget, like, you know, Keekstra was, you know, he was, he, he, he taught students. He was a teacher. 
I mean, there are examples in our legal history of people who were like really true hate mongers who had positions of authority over students and stuff like that. And in those cases, I think there is an argument for Section 319 of our, our, our criminal code here in Canada, which is, is a provision against hate speech. But most of the time you hear about free speech controversies, they're about people who, who don't have views like that. Like, you know, Jordan Peterson has caused near riots at several universities. You know, at Queen's University, someone was arrested because police said they had a weapon with them. It was, I think it was like, yeah, it was like a Garrett's or something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it was really, yeah. really creepy. And this is a guy, Peterson, who like the most controversial thing he has said is that he won't use invented pronouns. He will call, <laughs> you know, he will call you he or she. Now you, you may say, okay, well, I find it offensive that he won't call me, you know, Zig or Zoig or whatever, but that's a far cry from, you know, let's throw purple people uh, in camps or let's throw green people out of the country. Like the people who are causing the most controversy, and this is, by the way, and now we're getting into why people, some people are, Quillette drives them crazy. It's often the, the people who aren't the radicals, but who are just off the received wisdom who get the most abuse. Because those are the people that the dogmatists on both sides see as dangerous because they see their message. You know, if, if you say, hey, I'm pro-choice and I believe in affirmative action and all that stuff, but I don't believe that we should use invented pronouns, that's the person who's most dangerous to the dogmatists because they appear to be reasonable. And those are often the ones that get trashed the hardest on social media. Like if yeah. you look at, at, you know, like you look at Twitter and some of these mobs, the people who get mobbed the hardest, it's usually a woman who is on the left, who says the wrong thing on Jezebel or on Huffington Post or pisses off the wrong person, but is basically a progressive, but they're the person who gets mobbed because it's extremely important for both sides to keep their own foot soldiers in line. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, Margaret Atwood makes that point in, uh, am, you know, Am I a Bad Feminist, where in that wonderful piece where she says, you know, in extreme times, uh, nobody is hated more than moderates, right? And that's... I mean, and female classic. moderates. And, and women are getting... and Because and we, now we're, we're going far afield, but we're talking about the response to Stephen, Stephen Galloway uh, at University of British Columbia and the people who demanded due process for him, including Margaret Atwood. She, I, I think it was her who made the point that it was the women who, the, the female authors who made that demand, who got much worse treatment than the male authors who, who signed the UBC Accountable Manifesto on behalf of Galloway. And, and I think there, I'm, usually I'm not uh, talking about, you know, just institutional sexism and stuff like that. But in this case, I think there, there is this expectation, this deeply sexist expectation on the left that women have some special responsibility to toe the line um, in an especially meticulous way on anything to do with identity politics or gender. Uh, and I've seen some some really horrible treatment of any woman, including my boss, Claire Lehman, who, who dare uh, uh, cast aside taboos about the way we talk about identity politics. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, the, the classic sort of statement analysis of this is uh, Eric Coffer's book, The True Believer, I think it's 1950. And it's just an amazing book, but he, he has these direct quotations from Adolf Hitler and from all these various different people where they specifically say how they see the extremists on the other side mm. as potential converts. And he says, if you look at the personnel, many of the people who were far left at the beginning of the 20th century ended up being far right in the 20s and then maybe far left again. And there was a great deal of bouncing from extreme to extreme. And we've all seen this personally. The person who's in a cult at 20 is like super religious at 25 and then is, you know, whatever they do, they're extreme about it, right? And he said where there's not a lot of movement is around sort of liberal, moderates, uh, center Democrats, like people in the and that's why they're viewed with special hatred because they know those are the people that are a real problem, right? They're the you're not going to move them. The communists hated if you were if you were a Bolshevik in the interwar period, the person you hated most was the Menshevik, and the person who you hated most after the bat after that was the Social Democrat, because those are the people who um, they were competing for your oxygen. 
and <laughs> and 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 those are the people who you had to bring online. Uh, and about the, the sociological pattern you're describing, uh, George Orwell uh, put it quite well. Uh, he was talking about he, how many of the most dogmatic communists that he knew uh, a few years before had been extremely fervent Catholics. <laughs> and and they and, and and like in the space of a few days they they converted to communism, and he it was brilliant insight. He said what these people are really attracted to isn't Catholicism. You know they're they're fervent Catholics. They become fervent communists, but they're really attracted to isn't the Catholicism or the communism. It's the fervency. They uh, and and we have a great example of that. Michael Corin, uh, who's a Canadian commentator. Uh, who's, I think he's had three different religions. He's, uh, depending upon what you read of him, uh, but he was like the most militant imaginable uh, right-wing cultural warrior in Canada, uh, had a Christian TV show, railed against gay marriage, uh, was a, a huge firebrand on campus. Uh, there were, yeah, I remember at University of Toronto, there's a protest way back in the 90s when he appeared there. Uh, and then he all of a sudden had an awakening and now he's writing columns in the Toronto Star and he's calling out anyone who's conservative as as uh, as wrongheaded, and he's more liberal than thou. And and he's an example of somebody who is a very smart guy, um, and his brain is so big that he's capable of making a great case for whatever ideology he happens to be embraced, <laughs> embracing. And so yeah. if you took a snapshot of, if you, you know, he wrote, a, I think he wrote a book, I think it was called Why, Why Catholics Are Right, or something like that. And if you read the book, it's like, wow, this is a stunning manifesto uh, you know, showing why Catholics are right. And then a couple of years later, he wrote another book about, oh, you know, it wasn't called Catholics are Stupid, but it was basically like why he didn't believe any of that stuff anymore. And that was also a well-written book. But yeah. this is this is someone who who is addicted to the idea of of having a strong, um, uncompromising view of the world, but he doesn't especially care what that view is. Yeah, no, that that's exactly Eric Hoffer's point. He talks about that, but it's funny because Ignatius Loyola, when he was going before the Pope and trying to set up, you know, the Society of Jesus and trying to get funding for it, uh, to prove to the Pope how powerful and useful rhetoric was, he got up. And he gave a speech on a topic, and it was long, and it was absolutely riveting and convincing. And then the next day, he stood up before the Pope and gave uh, a speech arguing exactly the opposite side, and he was just as riveting and just as convincing. And by the end, the Pope was shaking his head, and he's like, yeah, we're going to give him a lot of money. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. we, need, we need that person, you know, somebody who can have that, give us that skill, right? And it's, so. I think it's, uh, we describe it as a skill, but I also think it is important that as intellectuals, we're, we are aware that there are good arguments on behalf of the other side, and that the people who are making those arguments often are making them in good faith. And it's not the worst thing in the world when we articulate those arguments ourselves uh, as part of an intellectual exercise. They, they say that um, one thing you should do in business meetings or or, or even, you know, if you're having an argument with a spouse or something like that, and you're, you want to show them that you're listening, when they, when they recite their, their complaints to you, you say them back to them. And not like in any kind of sarcastic way, right? but you say, it, you say their complaints back to them in, in a way that shows them that you understand what they're saying. And, um, and this is one strategy people have just for interpersonal conflict avoidance. And it does work because it, it shows that you're not just sitting there waiting to make your point. You're actually listening to what their point is. And, and this, we're coming back to the purpose of Quillette. Quillette is a place where, where the people who do write for it and the people who edit it, including me, we do take seriously the arguments of people who don't happen to agree with us. And, and I like to think that in my own writing, uh, I do spend part of my time in, in the essays I write where I, I read back the concerns and the arguments of the people who, who don't necessarily agree with me. Uh, yeah. And I think that's important for people to do. Well, I saw, you know, recently, I just I saw this in my interactions with you because uh, there was an article uh, in Quillette and, um, and basically it, it was talking about the culture at Concordia University, which is my I did my undergrad there. Uh, and it was, and by total coincidence, I happened to know the professor uh, 
you know, the, one of the anecdotes was referring to. And so I, you know, I, I contacted this guy and I said, hey, you know, there's this article in Gulat <laughs> and it basically uh, mentions your class. And it, it was it was interesting because he was like, oh, that's that's not at all how I remember it. And I remember it like this. And I remember I, I contacted you and your immediate response was, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, he should write a response. Yeah, you know, and I'll uh, I'll publish it. Like, he should write a response to that, and like we can. That seems to me exactly the sensible approach. But that's you know? the. the uh, it's funny you say that because people are shocked sometimes when I say that. Um, you know, we talked earlier about Matthew Sears, uh, this um, academic at um, Acadia University in Canada, and sometimes he's held up as sort of like this comic book caricature of, of, of a left wing guy and. He, d- he does that to himself, unfortunately, because of his Twitter feed. It's like exclamation marks and all caps and stuff like that. But he's a smart guy, and he's written for the Washington Post. And on at least one recent occasion, I, I, I sent him a message, and I said, you know, if you feel strongly about this, you should write for Quillette. And uh, I, I don't think he will, because he's gone on record as saying that Quillette is, is like their Sturmer. So he probably won't. <laughs> But, but he but he backtracked on you know I was one of the founding members of Heterodox Academy and he backtracked the other day and I was very impressed by that. So he Heterodox, said, yeah. so go ahead, you go go no, ahead. He he basically backtracked and said I was I was it was unfair of me to sort of uh, say all these nasty things about Heterodox Academy. I've gotten to know more people, uh, and it's it's not that. So he might change his mind about Quillette. So if I could just say one thing about Heterodox Academy, because uh, I went to the, a couple of weeks ago, they had a big meetup of Heterodox Academy uh, in New York City, and uh, I represented Quillette there, and I heard the speeches, which were great. And Heterodox Academy, as you know, uh, better than I do, is that it's devoted to the idea of just bringing a diversity of viewpoint uh, to, to everything. What's interesting about Heterodox Academy is their commitment to the idea of bringing diversity of viewpoint to everything and free speech even extends to the meta issue of whether you need to bring uh, diversity of viewpoint to everything and whether you have to allow free speech in regard to everything. And they actually had a panel where they talked about this issue and on the panel were Two people who said, "No, you know what? I don't. We don't think there's a lot of censorship on, on university campuses, and we think it's fine to have some limit on what people can say." Uh, Jason Stanley from Yale University uh, was one of those two guys, mm-hmm. um, and Angus Johnson from City University of New York, who are two people on the left who who were defenders of of, of the academic culture. So even at Heterodox's Academy, you know, this big blowout they were having in New York. Uh, it wasn't just kind of like a rally for people who who think one way and want to hear speeches and get their own views read back to them. They had people at that event challenging the very premise on which Heterodox Academy was founded. And I totally respected that. And as a journalist, I found it made the discussion so much more interesting. So mm-hmm. it wasn't one of these events. You know, this is this is one of my problems when you go to... Uh, you know, some journalistic event these days where it's like, you know, let's say the it'll be some conference where the, it'll be, um, you know, do we need more X in journalism where X is transgender people or this or, you know, whatever. And you'll have 17 speakers and all 17 speakers are like, answer the question in exactly the same way. <laughs> and it may be, I agree with them. It may be I have, depending on what X is, I may agree with them, but it's so fucking boring. Yeah, like, no, who, it's who absolutely, It's just yeah. super, and it's, and then, and everyone's clapping and it's just, people are high-fiving like, hey, well said, dude. And you look around the crowd and it's just, it's everyone, they knew exactly what the speakers were going to say. They know exactly what they believe. They're going to leave the room believing the very same thing. It's just a waste of everyone's day. And, and I hate events like this. And the Heterodox Academy meetup in New York was not like that. And yeah. And, so, no, well, I've had a couple of times where somebody has sent me, you know, because there were a number of my colleagues and friends were really pissed off that I, uh, that I was part of Heterodox and they said, this is, you know, just a right wing front and all this stuff. And so I would get messages sometimes from friends saying, look at this, you know, whatever left wing progressive prof who's getting into is being really persecuted and free speech. How come Heterodox Academy is not saying anything about that? So I, I you know, send a message to, to John Hyde and I say like, hey, you know, what are we doing about this? And immediately 
he would they'd be doing something about it they'd be out like you know taking a position on it and immediately so they're very very committed to I the principle that this should be for everybody that's a super important thing and a super important response uh i try and do the same thing because um you know there are people who will contact me about free speech issues i i I set up a small fund for it's what I call victims of ideological mobs on campus. And mm-hmm. um, I, I run it in partnership with uh, a lawyer in Toronto. And uh, when, you know, when people get mobbed on campus and they have legal expenses, uh, it helps defray their expenses. And people will come to me and they'll say exactly the same sort of thing. Like say, hey, you know, I have this friend of mine and, you know, uh, B'nai B'rith or Hillel targeted him because he um, he's a supporter of BDS. And I, I bet you would never support that guy. And I say, I 100% support that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't support BDS, uh, you know, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. I don't support that movement. I don't think it's anti-Semitic, though. I don't think it's hate speech. I think if you're a student on a Canadian campus and you happen to be a supporter of BDS and you get disciplined because people say you're anti-Semitic, that's bullshit. Uh, mm. And so, I, you know, what's good for the goose, I, I and, and I think it's very important uh, as Jonathan Haidt did, you have to be public about that. Uh, mm-hmm. Because if, if you believe in due process, if you believe in freedom of inquiry and expression, um, you, you absolutely have to be fair-minded about it. And once you expose yourself to the, the charge of hypocrisy, people aren't going to take you seriously and you're just, you're just going to be seen as another culture warrior. And we have more than enough culture warriors already. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I was just wondering if you... Uh, I, in the closing part, if you could maybe tell our listeners if they uh, if they want to support Quillette, how they could do that. And maybe if you could just talk. Uh, I know you have another new venture. You've been a very busy bee this year. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about your podcast and maybe just plug it a bit and let them know, you know, what you're doing. Right. Sure. Maybe we'll, um, and we'll, we'll finish off with that. Okay, well, finishing off with self-promotion, that's great. I, uh, <laughs> uh, so if they want to find out uh, more about Quillette and especially how to submit to Quillette, uh, which is, is always top of mind for me, uh, if they go to my Twitter account, which is just J-O-N-K-A-Y, uh, my pinned tweet is, um, it's a Twitter thread. I think it's, it's not long. It's like a dozen tweets, basically about what we're looking for at Quillette, uh, what we pay, uh, what the process is, and um, it's got my email on it, which is just john at quillette.com. Uh, talks a little bit about what I do, how long I've been doing it at Quillette. The podcast that I'm involved with, we've put out three episodes, and we'll have a few more coming out in fall. It's called uh, Wrong Speak, um, and it's available on iTunes and um, CastBox and you know, this, all, all the other uh, software programs that you can download podcasts. And my partner there is Deborah So, who's a scientist here in Toronto, and talks a little bit about some of the subjects that we're talking about here, but more of a scientific uh, point of view. That's called Wrong Speak. Uh, and in terms of supporting what I do, I'm, I'm very lucky. I uh, get paid by Quillette, and I'm a, I write some books. But if you want to support Quillette, uh, Quillette has a Patreon account, and you can just go to the Quillette, uh, Quillette website click on the link and you could give $10 a month or whatever to Quillette and uh, that will be very much appreciated. Yeah, and I would recommend that our listeners do that thing. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's always really fun to talk to you. You have like a comedian's timing, which is makes it so easy to interview. <laughs> like, um, the, uh, it, it's very kind of you to say that. It is, that is not a universally held view of the way I communicate. Uh, if you go on social media, <laughs> you'll find all sorts of other perspectives on uh, how I affect people. So. <laughs> All right. Well, have a wonderful day. And just remember to uh, keep your computer open for a little bit so that the feed gets uh, gets uploaded. I will do that. Thanks. Thanks. I, right. By the way, I took a lot of your time. It was an hour and a half. So thank you for your patience. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.